Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. If some days you doubt yourself and you don't know what you're doing, if you've ugly cried alone in your bedroom because you felt like you're failing, well, I just want you to know you're not alone and you have come to the right place. Raising tweens and teens in today's world is not easy. And I'm on a mission to equip you to love well and to raise emotionally healthy, happy tweens and teens that thrive. I believe that moms are heroes and we have the power to transform our family and to impact future generations. If you are looking for answers, encouragement, and to become more of the mom and the woman that you want to be, welcome. I'm Cheryl Gould, and I am so glad that you're here. Hi, friend. Welcome to the show today, and I am so glad that you're here with me. And before we launch into our podcast episode today, I want to make sure that you have signed up for our three-day free workshop series Parenting Reboot, How to Build Communication and Connection with Your Teen, and it is kicking off March 14th at 12 noon central, and it's March 14th, 15th, and 16th, and we are going to be talking all about building that communication when our tweens and teens don't open up and talk to us, and how to how to get them to open up and talk to us and build that important connection with our kids. We're going to talk about things like what is happening developmentally that causes them to act the way that they do. Because when we can understand what's going on, we can have greater empathy and we can parent in a way that is a much more effective. And we're also going to be talking about those things that we need to stop doing and what we can start doing instead to provide for our tweens and teens deeper needs and actually give them, you know, what they really need from us. And we sometimes get it really confused because we've never done this before. And then uh, day number three, we're going to talk about setting limits and boundaries and we're going to talk about what we can say instead of what not to say we need to know what we can say instead and we're going to be talking a lot about that and connecting with our hearts and I have found that the moms that uh, come to the workshops they just they they talk about how they start putting some of these tools in place and the understanding and the strategies that I share and what a big difference it begins to make in their relationship with their kids. So I don't want you to miss out on that. And then we also open up our inner circle, which is our membership group right after that. So if you feel like you want more support, you want to be with other moms that are right there in the trenches with you, I do an eight-week parenting program and I'll tell you all about that in the coming weeks, but you can check it out at momsoftweensandteens.com forward slash reboot and you can sign up there. One of my favorite things to do and I get to personally connect with you and if you cannot come live, you will get the replay when you sign up. So moving right along to our episode today because it is so Good. I am talking with Rachel Macy Stafford, and maybe many of you know her as a hands free mama. She is a New York Times best selling author of Hands Free Mama, Hands Free Life, Only Love Today, and Live love now. And she is on the podcast today to talk about her new book, which is called Soul Shift, The Weary Human's Guide to Getting Unstuck and Reclaiming Your Path to Joy. And She is a beautiful writer, a beautiful human being. I love her work. I love her books. I love what she's doing. And we talk a lot about just our to-do lists and breaking free of control and those things that prevent us from experiencing that joy. And 
also how to kind of write our priorities. And I know for me, that's always really diff- been difficult to what get down to what really matters. And Rachel talks about her personal story. And when she started shifting her focus, the difference that she started experiencing, not only in herself, but in her children. And also how to be authentic. We hear a lot about that buzzword, but how can we really embrace who we are and think about what do we really want and what really matters to us? Because it's so easy, as we all know, to get caught up in what the world is telling us we should really value. So I love this interview with Rachel, and I know you're going to get so much value from it too. So let's dive in. Well, welcome, Rachel, to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm happy to be here. Well, we are going to have such a good conversation. I am super excited about your latest book that just came out. You're a New York best-selling author. You've written four books. Your first one, I have them all. The first one was Hands-Free Mama. Mm -hmm. And now you have come out with your fifth book. Yes. Wow. (laughs) Well, it's it's coming out in March. So we want everybody to jump on early. But it's called Soul Shift, The Weary Human's Guide to Getting Unstuck and Reclaiming Your Path to Joy. And I am loving reading this book right now. And it's funny, you emailed me like, oh, don't stress about sending the questions. And I'm like, I'm I'm not because I'm reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay, it's like, working. It's like washing over me. And it's so much what moms that are listening need to hear. Mm, good. Really good. Yeah. Okay. So, I want you to jump in and tell us a little bit about your story. But what I was really struck by that resonated with you is how three main people in your life really set you on this journey. And can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I would love to. So um, my personality's kind of like a planner. Like I like to have predictability in my life. Like that makes me feel a sense of calm. And, you know, I'm, I'm going along in my life and I am like, okay, I kind of have things planned out how they're going to go. And then I fall in love with a person who has like this spontaneous spirit about him, Scott. And he, he's like, he doesn't think anything of like, oh, hey, we have this opportunity to move to a new state next week because there's this great opportunity for my job. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I would like take a year to plan something like that, you know? So Scott (laughs) in my (laughs) life, Scott coming into my life um, was like this, this pushing me out of this comfort zone of like, I like to plan ahead. I like to know what's happening. Um, so, you know, cause sometimes we would move, I think we moved like seven times before my girls were in elementary school. So just having to start fresh each time in each new city, that was hard for me, but also good for me you know, to be at, to be pushed out of that comfort zone. But then meanwhile, we're, we're going to all these new places. And then meanwhile, I'm realizing that the children I have also are pushing me out of my comfort zone. So the three people who, who kind of like pushed me to start this journey of, you know, looking at myself and thinking, okay, you know, here's an opportunity to grow and, and learn, you know, what it is that makes me thrive. And it may not be what I thought it was. So I have Scott, Natalie, and Avery. And Natalie was, when she was little, she was just such a risk taker and always just being so independent. And so that really also, you know, threw me for a loop 
Then we have Avery, who is like a, I call her a noticer because she's just everything she takes in the world, just very intentionally, very slowly. And so that was a thorn in my side because, you know, I'm all about let's be productive, let's be efficient. And so what what happened was, I realized that the more that I tried to cling to my way of being, of having things be planned out and predictable, the the more that it took away from what their true inherent gifts were. It was like the the harder I grasped to to have control and have the, my girls be who I thought they should be and and Scott, you know, he, he, you know, not to be his such a spontaneous, um, easygoing. I'm like, how can you be so relaxed right now? Like it's driving me crazy, you know? And I was, I turned into kind of like this really toxic manager yeah, in my house. And that is, you know, just getting to that point when I realized I don't like the person I'm becoming. Um, Scott telling me, you're never happy anymore, Rachel. Like hearing that and hearing him say it, not like a judgmental way, but like a concerned, sad, like where where did this joyful person that I once knew, where did she go? And that's kind of like, there were there were a few little seeds that were planted along the way, but that's one of them that really made me become aware that I was not going down a path that I wanted to go down. And I really needed to take a good look at myself and stop blaming my external circumstances and just start really looking inside. Oh, Rachel, that is so beautiful. And I love the quote from your book, the more I try to control the natural inclinations of my children, and we'll add your husband, the more pain and discomfort I caused. Mm -hmm. And I know that the moms that are listening can so relate, and I certainly relate, I that managing everybody that you talk about, so I you know that you're talking about, so I don't have to feel all the anxiety, the upset, all the feelings I'm feeling inside, I'm going to, I, you know, try and manage everybody. So I don't have to feel that, which is what you talked about in your book. And I'm like, yes, because I was, I, my oldest was strong-willed and impulsive too. And I was just always on high alert. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to calm my nervous system down. Yeah. Yeah. Just bringing up a lot of stuff. But we so often, I think, want to fix our loved ones, our kids, whatever that is. If I could just like get her to be less impulsive, then I wouldn't feel all of those feelings rather than what you're saying to really embrace the essence of who they are and then use it as an opportunity for growth and healing and learning. Yeah, which. Yeah, is so much what Soul Shift is about. So tell us, how did you begin to break free from the control and the managing? So because I'm a special education, because I'm a special education teacher of kids with uh, severe behavior issues, I am familiar with the concept that if you have big changes that you want to make in in your life or your behavior, it's not going to happen through these big sweeping changes or overhauling your life, you know? So it was good that I knew that because when I fully accepted and realized just how much pain I was causing my family, um, I realized, okay, I need to make changes, but how do I do that? I have responsibilities. I have obligations. I have a life. I can't just, 
you know, chuck my phone out the window, you know, not stop going to my stressful job. I can't stop those things, but what can I do? So the practice of presence is where I began to really kind of loosen that grip that I felt all the time was just, you know, like I felt like I was always late. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was always about to scream at someone. Um, And so I started with just these very small time increments, 10 minutes of pushing all of my distractions away. So like for me, the phone was a huge, uh, a huge trigger for me, like where I would let whatever's happening on the phone with whether it's a notification or someone's asking me to do something that pulled me away a lot. So the phone, the computer, because of my work, and I was taking classes at the time, you know, it was like, I don't want to multitask my life away. So what do I need to do to just have like this block of just undistracted time? So my to-do list was also a huge part of what sabotaged my joy and my, and being in the moment, because I was always like, well, if it's not on the list, it's not worth doing. You know how we, in our society, it's all about what can you check off the list and you can't check off connection, you know, connecting with your heart or connecting with your loved one. And so that kind of stuff fell to the bottom of my list. So my practice of presence, it didn't really matter what I was doing. Sometimes I was journaling. Sometimes I was just Um, reading through letters that my grandma had written me because my grandma just always made me feel so good about myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether it was just sitting outside with listening to the birds, it didn't matter what I was doing in that practice of presence. The conditions were the part that mattered. No phone, no computer, no to-do list. And for me, no guilt, you know, it's, it's really hard to practice presence if you're also berating yourself saying you, you know, you are a bad mom or you, you aren't going to be able to do this. You, you're not going to be able to sit here for 10 minutes and be present. So also relinquishing that judgment of myself to just be in that moment. And what I found over time by practicing presence was I didn't have to be scared of some of those uncomfortable feelings that I had been practically running from. And those uncomfortable feelings, a lot of it has to do with my my sense of worth. And being present with myself, I, I admitted like, I don't feel like I'm enough a lot of time. I feel insecure and I'm projecting that onto my children. So when I'm yelling at them before we go out to a social event, I'm not yelling at them because maybe they aren't ready. I'm yelling at them because I just stood in front of the mirror for 10 minutes and berated myself about how I look. So all of this awareness about what is triggering me to control, to yell, to um, manage and and um, just strive all the time was this sense of I'm not worthy unless I do this, this, or this, or unless I look this way. And so the practice of presence was the beginning of Uh, this journey where I developed other practices, and one of them was the practice of self-worth, to really get back in touch with those parts of myself that I didn't think were worthy or that someone had told me 
um, you can't do that. You're you're not smart enough or you're not creative enough. Um, you don't look the part, you know, so having to sit with those uncomfortable feelings, some of them things that people had said to me mm-hmm. and be able to say, wait a minute, that that's not my truth. That's something someone said to me. They don't know me. And so that is where it all began with just the practice of presence and, and sitting with myself. Wow. Yeah. That, and, and, and that being, and what I'm struck by, I so resonate with the not feeling like enough and the doing, 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 and I have to do in order to be worthy. I have to be more, I have to, you know, fill in the blank, whatever those limiting beliefs are that we have, but I'm wondering about you, what I found out, I'm trying to do less, but as things grow with what we're doing, there's more demands, but I'm shocked at how everything ends up being okay. When I make time for those things to really connect, take time to journal, all those things that really fill me up. And I'm like, oh, the sky isn't falling. I can't believe that. And and I actually have more, more peace. And more oh. joy. And that's what you what you really talk about is the more that we can make room for those things, then have you and I'm sure you found that. Can you talk about the difference it's made in your life and the difference it's made in your relationship with your kids since you started doing this? Because you write a lot about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was a pretty immediate realization that okay. I, when I would see an opportunity for connection, whether it was, you know, my husband was coming home and entering the door and I went over to him and looked in his eyes and said, I'm so happy to see you. Or whether it was um, one of my girls working on something uh, at the kitchen table and I'm, I sit down physically and just be there with her. What I found was all that stuff that we feel is so urgent, like I don't have time to do these things. We realize, wait a second, you know, it it puts the things that the world calls urgent into perspective because it's so easy to get wrapped up in, I, I have to, um, meet the demands Mm -hmm. that the external world is putting on me that I think I can't do what I need to do or what my family needs to do, needs me to do. Um, But the truth is in those moments of connection, you feel a peace and um, a, a, a calm that you don't feel ever when you are running from point A to point B at a hundred miles per hour. So every time that I would choose connection over efficiency, productivity, productivity, um, speed, I would remember, ah, oh, this is what matters. That other stuff, it truly can wait. You know, people say this is urgent. You know what? That's your opinion. I'm deciding what's urgent and what gets a priority in my life. And it's funny because when I realized, okay, I'm going to have to start saying no to people (laughs) and say no (laughs) for me is not an easy thing. Um, But I was like, okay, if I want to have these pockets of time where I can really be present, I'm going to have to say no, start saying no to things. And I'll, I'll never forget when I said no to someone who called from the girls school who wanted me to uh, head up a book fair. Um, Rachel, can you ha- head up the book fair? And I was known for being really organized. And, you know, so once you get on that list of, oh, she can really knock things out, you're going to get called a lot. Um, so <laughs> I said I was like, all right, Rachel, this is your chance. This is, you've been practicing. So I said, I'm so sorry, but 
but I'm not going to be able to do that this time. And she goes, oh, no problem. I'll just go to the next person on the list. And I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) there's a list. And I didn't know about this. Like, I was like, why did I, why did I always think it had to be me? You know, I think we, I think we real we don't realize, wait a second, I don't have to hold up the world in every single area of my life. And I am worthy of saying, no, this is not going to work for me. I'm making time for this, what I want to do. Um, instead of I have to please or I'm not going to be worthy. You know, I have to accommodate because I was an accommodator, always trying to make sure everybody was happy. But guess who's not happy? Then me, my, my, I'm not happy. And then it's affecting everyone in my family. And then my whole house is this very toxic environment. Yeah. Oh, that is so good. If somebody, yeah, I'll go to the next person on the list. And I, <laughs> and I think about like how it's the world. I love how you compared like the demands that we put on ourselves based on the external world and like, oh, somebody wants me, somebody needs me. But then we're choking the very things that are going on in our home in order to do that pleasing. Right. And then we want everybody to get on the program in our home. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, you say something uh, in the book, it's, you say never rejection, always connection. Mm -hmm. And I love that, like never rejection and how you were talking about um, just how it was spilling over and how you responded to your kids Mm -hmm. and, and can, and then, but accepting yourself and not rejecting yourself really helped build that connection. Yeah. And and you talk about Avery in the book where you start seeing her actually talking differently to herself, her own self-talk. Can you share a little bit of the shifts that you saw in your kids as a result of doing the whole soul shift? Definitely. Um, so one of the biggest um, motivators, I guess, for me, to take that look inward was um, Natalie's my oldest. And like I was saying, Natalie is um, risk taker, spontaneous. Um, Sometimes, you know, she just dives right in and it would be like, "Uh, uh, uh," you know, that's going to make, that's going to be messy or you're going to make a mistake. And, you know, so I'm, I'm projecting all these limiting beliefs on Natalie And I watch over time as she starts to lose kind of this, this light in her, she starts picking the top of her lip because she's anxious because of, Mm. I, I, I would blow up over small things and she would then want to fix them. And so it was interesting that when I was able to say to her, I am mean to myself sometimes. And when I'm mean to myself, I'm mean to you. Mm. And saying that to her was like the beginning of this idea that I don't have to hide my humanness from my children. In fact, putting it out there actually helps because Natalie then was like, oh, it's not my fault. And and I started saying even, I'm feeling anxious because grandma is in the hospital. And so I just need you to give me a little bit of quiet time. So being able to tell my girls, like, I'm anxious because of this, they will know that I'm not lashing out at them because of something they've done, you know, so then they don't un- internalize that. But that idea of always connection, never rejection, it was that communication of our feelings, of our most uncomfortable feelings, that I would realize 
I, I want to tell Avery how to dress because <laughs> she is dressing in a way that I'm feeling like that's not going to portray our family the way I want to portray us. You know, I can't let her pick out her clothes. So when I realized I'm walking into Avery's room, she's gotten herself dressed. You know, she's seven or eight at the time. She's twirling in front of the mirror because she's put on this little skirt with this top that doesn't match. She's done her own hair. She is looking at herself like, I am so beautiful. And I'm coming in there to tell her, is that what you're going to wear? And thankfully, I'd been working on my own, you know, paying attention to those uncomfortable feelings. And I'm looking at her and I'm, and I'm like, do you really want to be the reason that her joy is sabotaged in this moment? Because you can take it from her by saying, is that what you're going to wear? Or I think you should wear this instead of you did a good job. And I love that you have your own sense of style. So, you know, beginning to separate my worthiness that came from appearance, being able to recognize, Rachel, you, your worth is not wrapped up in your appearance. And if you don't want Avery and Natalie to go through life thinking that their appearance defines their worth, then you should keep your mouth shut and let her be. And so let her be became one of my mantras. Let her be, let her be herself. Let her come as she is. And then starting to say it to myself. I I actually stopped getting in front of the mirror because the mirror was so damaging to, to my dreams and my connection with people and my authenticity. I'm like, I know I'm not going to show up if I stand in front of the mirror before I go and do this thing that I've been wanting to do. So I stopped using the mirror, started putting on hats and being able then to just go out the door. Yeah. And you look so good in a hat. Oh. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. And you have your red hat and I love that, hmm. you know, and you show one of your kids and you have a whole blog post on that, that I just yes. love. Thanks. You said so many good things. Oh, just that mantra of let her be capital B E. Yeah. Not putting, I call it the image manager in me that wants mm. to manage my image. And so Mm -hmm. my kids being a reflection of like, I totally relate to the clothing part, like peace, especially when they hit the tween years and maybe, you know, they dressed like so cute and you could dress them. And now they're starting to dress how they want to dress and, um, and just being like, let them find out their sense of style, let them, what is the big deal, you know, but the, just that that mantra you use, let her be, let her show up as is like how healing that is. Well, and, and since you mentioned tweens and teens, um, I think it is important that we recognize that they're showing up in the way they feel most comfortable. And that's one thing that I had to get used to. Like I've always I was raised, like, if you're going out to dinner, you're going to get, you know, kind of dressed up. And so I know that sometimes teenagers today, they, they just want to be in their comfy clothes. And so it was like, I, I had to learn like, okay, is this really something that I want to battle about? Or can I just let her show up in the way that she's most comfortable? Because sometimes the reason they dress a certain way is related to their body image. And so letting them be and, sh- and, you know, it's like, well, what's the point here? Do I want her to come and be, join us at the restaurant or do I want to force her to wear something that she's not going to feel comfortable in? And then she's not going to want to come. The, 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 the part that I try to focus on is I just want her to be there. 
And I want her to be there in the way that she feels most comfortable and to let go of what, you know, my expectation is, you know, because I think a lot of it that are the expectations that we put on our loved ones really can then affect how we are treating our treating them. Yeah. And then you, you end up saying something before you go out to dinner and you get in a fight and yeah. then you go to dinner. And the most important thing that really matters is that connection mm-hmm. and here, you know, that we're going out together and it doesn't feel good. Exactly. Yep. You um, say something else that fits with this. It really struck me when you wrote, we, when we see each other's scars, we love each other more. Mm-hmm. And, and I learned that when I started on my, my personal growth journey, um, like 10 years, 15 years ago. And that was shocking to me because it was the opposite of what I believed. I thought if I can portray to the world, this perfect, try to be perfect and look good and have it all together, mm-hmm. but then being with other safe people and being able to really be vulnerable, which is what you you share so beautifully through everything you write, it really does make us, you know, it, it really does help us to love each other more. And because I read what you write, when you share your vulnerable side, it makes me love you, you know, through the pages wow. of your book. And then in turn, it helps me to love myself more. Yeah. And, um, and so you know, talk a little bit about, about how you experience this. Yeah, exactly what you were just saying. You know, I think that many of us grew up thinking that I had to hide my insecurities, my failures, the parts of myself that are not so pretty and becoming, but I remember very distinctly a phone call that I got from a friend and I happened to be crying because I just learned from the school that my youngest daughter um, would not be going to the next grade um, because of some problems, uh, the way that she was learning and, and a social issue. And I remember, like, I could not pull myself together because I literally had just got off the phone and my friend said, oh my gosh, what's wrong? And I just blurted out, this is what's happening. And she said, Rachel, this happened to us too. And she said, you know what? You are the right person to go through Avery to, to go beside Avery in this journey. And just like I was the right person to take my son through it. And I thought, oh my gosh, like if I hadn't told her what was really going on, I would not be able to have this comforting feeling and this friend that I could confide in. And so being able to talk to her about where what we were going through, that was where that phrase came from, when we see each other's scars, we love each other more. And I loved her. The more that I could talk honestly with her, the more she talked honestly with me. Mm-hmm. And that honestly, you you really can't experience true belonging if you have a facade up. You, you experience true belonging through your authentic self. Mm-hmm. And your authentic self is got some parts of you that are not going to be shiny and pretty and things that you want to be telling the world. But if you can talk to someone and you can find that safe person, you'll be surprised because then you can become that safe person for them. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. The exchange. And I want you to speak a little bit about your book because you break it down into eight you, you um, eight practices. Yes. 
And you have exercises in the book Mm -hmm. to walk, to walk you through these practices of soul shift. And so can you just, I don't expect you to go through eight, you know, all eight of them Mm -hmm. and you've spoken about some of them, but how did you choose them? Like, can you, and what, and what really can, you know, what do you think is most important to share with the listeners about, about them? So the way that I set up the soul shift journey um, in this book is very similar to how I experienced it in life. And that is, it was not a linear growth experience. It was kind of all over the place. Like I, like I said, I started with the practice of presence. I had no idea that was going to lead into the practice of self-worth. So it's like, I'm sitting with myself and, and letting these uncomfortable feelings come up. And then I'm realizing, wow, I am basing my worth on external measurements, but that's, that's not what I value. I don't value how people look, how successful they are. Um, I value people for their kindness and their generosity. And so it was like going through the, these practices. And then like, as a special education teacher, I was able to, to realize, okay, I can, I can make a strategy that's going to help me come back to what, what really measures my worth. It's not this, it's not this, it's, you know, how, how I'm showing up in the world, um, how I'm helping other people. And so this journey of practices, eight practices, like true self-worth, letting go of perfection, being kind to yourself, being your authentic self, self self-forgiveness, and offering your gifts to the world, those practices all evolved by working through this journey. And so I would realize, okay, now I'm really getting a handle on measuring my self-worth by meaningful measures. Now I'm starting to realize that my control is also related to that. And it's because I, I think I want things to be perfect, but it's really that I'm afraid it's not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. So then I start working on, okay, how can I start releasing this need to control, um, this need for things to go as planned? So again, I develop a strategy, um, you know, because you can't go from, I realize I, I like to control things to, I'm going to accept things as they unfold. You can't just mm-hmm. go from that thought to that thought. There is a, there's a shift. There's a behavior pattern that needs to be shifted. Um, and I call them habit shifts in the book. And so I walk people through how, what did this look like for me? What might that look like for you? Because the thing about these practices and this this territory, kind of like this garden territory, is you can go in any direction that you want to go in. And you might jump from practice of presence to self-forgiveness because you, when you're sitting with yourself, you might realize I am beating myself up for past mistakes. And until I forgive myself, I'm not going to be able to feel joy. So you might jump from practice of presence over to self-forgiveness and start working through self-forgiveness. And again, I have little strategies that I use. They're called um, baggage releasers that help people set down that baggage that they're carrying that is blocking them from their joy. In in all of these practices, you're going to find your obstacle to joy. And you're going to find something that you can do to shift from, you know, a painful truth, like I'm missing my life to I'm worthy of showing up for every minute of my life. So 
It's like a bridge that I help you get from this thought to not just thinking this, but believing this. I'm worthy of showing up for every moment of my life. And that is so transformative and so healing. And I think we we often just want to arrive. And you talk about that over and over and over again, that this is this is a journey. It takes time. Mm-hmm. It, just even how you started with noticing how you were feeling in your body, which you talk about, and then you know how you were feeling, and then those messages that you were telling yourself, and then to be able to write it down through the exercises so you can really look at it. Because writing it down, I'm sometimes shocked with what comes up. Yeah. And rather than just like thinking it, you're really working through those things and then able to write, take the false limiting belief and, and change it into what's really true. Like look at it and like you said, and go, is this really true? Is this what I really do value? No, but I'm living as if, because I'm hiding parts of myself. Yeah. And it's really that I love the analogy of baggage because it does the stuff weighs us down. And, well, and, yeah. and honestly, the, the main thing that I want people to get when they're reading is this is is to realize you have the answers inside you. Like this book is not going to give you answers. You have them. This book is going to help you by asking questions that maybe you've never asked yourself or give you tools that's going to help you figure out, oh my gosh, all this time I thought I thrived in these conditions, but actually I thrive in conditions like this. Or I always thought that my role as um, a people pleaser, you know, or a perfectionist, um, or a taskmaster, I thought, you know, that is who I had to be because this is where I got all the accolades growing up. This is what, how people know me, but really I'm not a taskmaster. I'm more of a go with the flow person. I just haven't had the space, the permission, the authority, because a lot of times it's just giving ourselves the authority to say, uh, hey, wait a minute. I don't, I actually don't like that. I, that's not really who I am. And then to start living by our true interests, our true passions, stating our opinion and not backing down. All of this is part of this journey to uh, validate your, your knowing because this world is going to tell you it thinks it knows what's best for you, but it doesn't. Yeah. You talk a lot about um, honoring your feelings, listening to yourself. And so through these exercises, there's just such a compassion. And it's, I, I'm just struck by that because we can think, oh, you know, I'm not this, I'm not that, but no through the exercises, you just keep on heaping this, this grace and love and, and honoring yourself and whatever comes up. And it's, we need that. We need that Mm -hmm. as we're working through the exercises that, that you share in the book. So thank you. Yeah. Super, you know, helpful. What, um, just a couple more, uh, one more question. Um, you talk about toxic positivity. Yeah. And I think that that's, there's a real distinction between mindfulness and gratitude and toxic positivity. And so can you share the difference? Yeah. Well, for a long time, when some of those uncomfortable feelings would come up for me, um, I would, I was conditioned to say things like, well, pe- other people have it worse than you, or um, you should be grateful. Um, just kind of dismissing mm-hmm. those feelings. And what I realize is, is no, these feelings are valid. 
these feelings have value and I need to listen to them because when you push down these feelings that keep coming up, like I'm feeling really sad about, you know, this fallout with my friend and you're over part of you's condition to say, well, that's silly. What, you know, you shouldn't let this get to you. You should just be grateful that, you know, you have a friend, but the more you're dismissing those feelings and telling yourself to accept it, you're devaluing yourself and you're disrespecting yourself. And so what I try to help people, like what you mentioned, there's a lot of compassion, a lot of grace, and just to be able to say, my feelings are important and they're valuable because they're telling me something. And for the longest time, I didn't know why am I getting so angry at people who ask things from me that feel like, what what makes them think that they have a right to ask me for these things? And I would get so angry. And I was like, part of me was like, why are you getting so upset? This is nothing to get upset over. But when I realized these are boundaries. People are disrespecting my boundaries. People are crossing boundaries. They're putting themselves in a role in my life that I did not invite them to. And so in that situation, anger is a service. Anger is protecting me. And so we, we truly are the only people who can protect ourselves. No one's going to do that for us. So listening to those feelings and saying, yeah, I'm really, I'm really upset that this person is asking this of me because it feels like my boundaries are not being respected and they're not. And so what am I going to do about this? Because I am not, I'm not a doormat. I'm not going to let this person keep walking all over me. That's just an example of toxic positivity and and how it worked for me in the soul shift journey. Yeah, it's, it's, I love that you mentioned that because it's something that I become more aware of that I get mad and want to blame people if they ask something from me, but it's because I don't like saying no, because I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> so that, mm-hmm. And then I feel like I have to say yes, but I'm mad at the person that they're asking, but really it's like you said, it's like, okay, this is good information that I'm mad because really it's just a sign that I'm feeling like I have to say yes, but I don't, I have a choice. You have a choice. (laughs) It's like, wow. So yeah. So I just love it, Rachel. I love this book. And when you think about what do you want moms to get from this book? Moms, whatever role the people that are listening play, they might not be moms, but what is your hope for this book? So I just want to say it's not too late. It's not too late to find that little dreamer inside of you that I, I, I believe we all have that part of ourselves that that was our most joyful, authentic, uninhibited self um, mine, I call mine, my dreamer girl. And once we start to get back in touch with that joyful, uninhibited part of ourselves, that part of ourselves can really give us good guidance as adults. And I like to say like the person who held my hand during writing of this book was my eight-year-old self. And she's been trying to tell me for decades that what I knew at eight years old is worth knowing as an adult, because so many of the things that I needed to thrive and to grow and to feel happy and to feel at peace are things that my eight-year-old self knows and remembers. And that's one of my favorite parts of the book is helping people remember that part of themselves. And once we feel that joy, 
it's amazing how that can then ripple out to the people around us. And then we can, when we show up as our authentic self, we're giving our kids permission to be their authentic self. We're giving, you know, our friends like that conversation I had with my friend. And so then when you feel that true belonging, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah. That your most alive self, your dreamer girl, I put awakening as you were sharing that, you know, awakening your dreamer girl Mm -hmm. and embracing her. Is there one thing your dreamer girl is doing now that, that you had closed her off? I know you said she was writing the book with you. Is there anything else that (laughs) I'm sure there's a lot of things, but well, it's funny because I've been doing more, um, traveling in the car by myself rather than traveling on a plane to go to speaking events and things. And I am very directionally challenged, but I have really like released the fact that it's okay if I get lost. And in fact, I've noticed that. So true story. I was going in the opposite direction that I should be going. As I was leaving South Carolina, I started heading for Florida (laughs) and my husband saw him on life 360 is like, Rachel, you are an hour out of your way. You need to go North. And I was like, oops, you know, I didn't, you know, but I was, I had my music going, I was singing, you know, and, and then I realized, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop and I'm just going to enjoy this little rest park area. And now as I was just literally laying in the grass at the rest park, an hour out of my way, I realized this is fun. This is, I like, I like this adventure. I like that I'm not, you know, berating myself because I got lost. I'm not mad because I showed up in a place I'm not supposed to be. And those are, that's my dreamer girl talking to me because five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have been very angry at myself. I would have said, you're, you are so dumb. How could you drive an hour out of your way? And you better get in the car and you better drive 80 miles an hour and you better not stop. You've got to get home. It's like this, this productivity driven person just was always in control. And I never, ever heard from my heart that, yeah, I'd really like to stop at that rest stop. Look, they have cold drinks, there's a river, there's a birds and, you know, things that I can notice, like, I'll never be here again. My, why does, might as well stop, you know? So being able to hear that part of myself, it talk about a stress reliever to be able to say to yourself, it's okay that you got lost and you went the wrong way. And it's okay that you're directionally challenged because you're not lost. You're just seeing new things. That's all, you know? Wow. And you just got get to be with yourself and have that joy. It yeah. opened you up to that joy. Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for how you're sharing your journey with us and taking us by the hand that we can join you on this journey and have healing and experience more joy and that dreamer girl that's inside of us. It's just yeah. dying to get out and break free. Absolutely. So tell our listeners where to find you, what you're up to, how they can connect with you. Yes. Um, So my website is handsfreemama.com. And if you go there, you can pretty much find like all my social media handles, which is like I'm I'm active on Facebook and Instagram at the Hands Free Revolution. Um, And also if you pre-order Soul Shift, which there's a link to purchase on my website, there is an amazing um, pre-order bonus gift that I created. It's a self-compassion starter kit. And I think that people are going to really enjoy it, not just for themselves, but maybe even to listen to with their teenagers, because my teenager, my 16 year old, and I actually, it's a lot of the things that we do with our self-talk as I was talking about shifting those limiting beliefs to self-compassionate beliefs, that's exactly what that whole self-compassion starter kit is. And that's free if you pre-order Soul Shift from wherever you like to buy books. 
So that's all can be found on my website. Oh, that makes it so worth it because we have to reprogram yes. our brains and our self-talk. So it can really help us with that. Thank you. I'm, yeah. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm working on it every day. So it actually <laughs> helps me to, to I made that um, little bonus gift. And it was like, my publisher was like, you don't have to go to all this work. You know, you can just pull something from the book. And I was like, no, I, I am making this because I need it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for okay. that. That's so good for our listeners to know that's available when they get your book. Yes, yes. Yeah. And we can all be on this journey together. So that's yeah. the only way. We got to do it together. It's not, life is not meant to be navigated alone. That's what I believe. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, thank you again, Rachel, for coming on the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. It's been so great to have you and talk with you. I've enjoyed myself too. Thank you. Well, that's it for today, friend. And thank you so much for joining me. And if you have not signed up for the three-day workshop series, Parenting Reboot, How to Build Communication and Connection with Your Teen, it is free. If you can't come live, you will get a replay. And it's just going to be a great time. And you're going to learn so much valuable stuff. And you will get to connect with me personally, which is one of my very favorite things to do. So go to momsoftweensandteens.com forward slash reboot and you can sign up there. So thank you for joining me today and have a great week and I will see you back here next time.